So I'm Nick Pentreath, um, ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I'm a principal engineer at IBM, where I work for uh, CoDay, which is the Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. Uh, I focus on machine learning, deep learning AI, and I'm an Apache Spark committer and PMC member, and I've written a fairly out-of-date book on machine learning with Spark. So before we start, just a little bit about CoDay. Uh, it was formerly known as the Spark Technology Center. Um, it was formed by IBM to, uh, to focus on Apache Spark and the surrounding ecosystem. And over the course of its, uh, its history, it expanded that mission to really focus on uh, AI and uh, deep learning and machine learning and data science in general. So now we have rebranded it as uh, CoDay, and we focus on enabling the end-to-end -end, uh, AI lifecycle in the enterprise. So we focus on Spark as well as the uh, Python data science stack, deep learning frameworks, and we've got a couple of uh, projects that we've uh, released, the Model Asset Exchange and the Fabric for Deep Learning, which I'll mention a little bit at the end if we have time. So today we'll start with a little overview of recommender systems uh, and then look at search and recommendations and how they, how they are integrated and how you can use search engines um, to serve recommender models. And in particular, the three sides of the coin, so the, the three different broad approaches that I see to, uh, to do that. And finally, end off with uh, some performance evaluations and a uh, con conclusion. So recommender systems are one of the earliest and certainly most high value use cases of machine learning that we've seen. You know, each and every one of us on our, in our daily lives comes into contact with a multitude of recommender systems ev you know, every day. So whether you're browsing in your online store, uh, you know, uh, streaming music, uh, looking at uh, YouTube, uh, using your social network apps, you're coming into contact with some form of recommendation and personalization system. And this is not just uh, per pervasive in the sense of uh, you know, affecting our lives, but, it, but it's pervasive in the sense of economic impact and value. So if we can improve the recommendation and personalization system, uh, there's real money to be made there. So. Amazon, for example, about 30% of their bottom line is accounted for by the recommender system uh, for companies like Netflix and other streaming sites. It might be as high as 70 or 80. For ad targeting, a lot depends on, on these, these systems and models. So in your recommendation engine, uh, you have two types of entities, users and items. Uh, the users are self-explanatory, and without them, there is no system. And the items can be anything. In this case, perhaps you know, a movie. And attached to each of those users and items uh, are pieces of metadata and activity data. So for users, it might be demographics, uh, geolocation. Uh, for items, it might be categories, tags, uh, and the content. And that aggregated activity data uh, might, might be for, the, for a movie, you know, uh, the number of likes, the number of plays, when it was last played. So this is uh, an indicator of uh, what is the activity around that. So our system requires... Uh, us to use this metadata and uh, this content in some way. So for example, we want to do filtering and grouping. We might want to uh, show recommendations that are based on a category. We might only want to show uh, popular items uh, or not so popular items if we want sort of long tail recommendations. We might want to show more recent items. We also need to apply business rules. So for example, based on uh, age, we don't want to show age-restricted content to younger viewers. Uh, we also might have geographical constraints, you know, uh, and data privacy regulation. So the core piece of data that we care about in a recommender system is the event. This is a user interaction. So every time a user comes and interacts with our system, they're telling us a little bit about themselves. Most of the examples that you see in recommender systems uh, and building the models are all around explicit preference data. So someone says, I give this movie a rating. But in most cases, uh, the vast majority of data available is of the implicit type. So a user comes along and they're interacting with the system. They don't specifically tell you, I really like this movie, here's a rating. Instead, you have page views, add to carts, purchases, and the, uh, you know, plays, follows, all these kind of implicit indicators of preference. That may mean that the user likes that, that item, but, but it may not. So a page view is a light indicator of preference. Uh, an add to cart might be a stronger one, and a purchase might be the strongest. But even if someone purchases something, it doesn't necessarily mean they like it because later on they may you know, give a negative review or even return that item. And unless your system captures that, you will never actually know that. So these events give us an indication about what user preferences are. 
And attached to each one of these events is a context. So every time a user comes and interacts with that system, they're using a, sp a specific browser, it's at a specific time of day, um, there's a geolocation attached to it. And context matters for recommendation because you, we may want to recommend, for example, different movies to a user based on whether they are sitting at home in the evening or whether they're on their commute to work or whether they're at work, perhaps, for example. So since most of this data is implicit, we have to think about how to handle implicit data. Um, and broadly speaking, you can in either incorporate it into the model directly, and we'll see uh, some examples of that later, or you can try and attach some sort of weighting scheme. You know, so all of this uh, binary zero, one implicit data can have a weight attached. So a page view might be a one, for example. Um, an add to cart might be a three, a purchase might be a five. Uh, so th this is difficult to, to necessarily do in a principled way, but you can, you can uh, wait, add these weights to the, the event and then use a standard model. But we definitely have to think about how to handle this in the system. Another key element of recommendation engines is the cold start problem. So when a new user or item comes into the system, that is cold start. For new items, we have no historical data, so we, we don't have a model for them. And typically, one needs to fall back to use baselines or item content to try and create some sort of recommendation. A new or unknown user might ev even either be a completely new user to the system, or perhaps they're anonymous. They're browsing you know, using, using a new device, or they uh, have ad blockers, or, or whatever the case may be. But in that case, again, we have no historical data for them, and we have some context data, but potentially very limited. So we can't, cannot directly use most of the kind of collaborative filtering-based models that we would normally use, uh, except for the fact that we can try and use item similarity for, let's say, the current item that the user is viewing, uh, if we've built a model for that item. Uh, or the, typically we try to represent the user as some sort of aggregation of the items in their session as they're browsing. So we, we try and build up uh, that, that user representation on the fly. And in some cases, contextual models can incorporate both the context data and the short-term history of that user during that session. So prediction in a recommender system is all about ranking. We have to take all the available content or items that we have in our system, and we want to present the user a list. And that list needs to be ranked in order of our estimated estimate of the preference of the user. So in other words, by likelihood that we think the user will interact with that item. And typically, we have very, very large item sets, and we only want to return a very, very small set, five or 10. Some of the serving requirements that we have for serving recommendation models, this is not exhaustive, but these are some key ones. As we've mentioned, we serving is about ranking large number of items, so we need to be able to uh, have a ranking system. In almost all cases, we want to do, be able to do some sort of filtering, whether by categories, popularity, time, price, geolocation, any uh, combination slice of slicing and dicing the metadata that we have around items or users, we want to be able to filter based on that. We would ideally like to use all the data we have available at prediction time, in particular content and context, because in, especially in the cold start problem, that is a rich data that we can use to still make a, you know, a principled prediction. We need to scale both with the item set and the feature set. So the item set, naturally, as we get more items, we need to scale that serving system. And the feature set, as we add more and more features that are used in the model or more and more contextual and metadata that's used in the model, we also need to scale that computation. We need to handle cold start. So both the system needs to perhaps incorporate this additional data that we can use to handle cold start. Uh, and we also need to you know, have some sort of content-based fallback, perhaps, or item aggreg aggregation capability. And finally, we would ideally like to easily incorporate new preference data, so uh, retrain models simply or fold into an existing model without doing a full retraining. So that's a brief whirlwind tour of recommendation engines, and p in particular what we need to serve them. And we'll talk about search and recommendations and how they uh, can interlock. Uh, but first, we'll just uh, take a little detour into some of the uh, sort of core models that we're going to discuss today. So the ratings matrix is at the, the center of most collaborative filtering approaches, and this represents the, the user interactions in this form of the sparse matrix. So the users as rows and the items as columns, in this case movies, and each interaction or rating that the user gives to a movie is represented here. So you'll notice it is sparse, and not all users rate all movies, um, and it's very large. And our goal is really to fill that matrix in. We need to predict for those missing entries um, what are going to be the highest uh, ranked in terms of preference. So one of the 
core earlier models as item to item co occurrence. Um, and effectively, we take that big matrix and we multiply by the transpose of the, mat of the same matrix and we get a co occurrence matrix. And each entry uh, specifies that, that um, a co occurrence happened between the item and the other item. So, in other words, they were, uh, they were interacted with by the same user. So th this, is a, this is typically done in a pre-computation fashion, so we'd like to pre-compute that entire big matrix offline, and then when scoring, we can either compute the item-to-item -item similarity on, on the fly, or we can again represent the user as a, uh, a kind of combination of their uh, previous uh, items that they've interacted with, and th that is a effectively a dummy item, and then we can use that to, uh, to get the similar items and f make a recommendation. Another way of doing this is to try to factorize that matrix. So we use a matrix factorization technique, um, and this is really about uh, using a model-based approach to actually try to complete that matrix. So one typical approach is to split it into two smaller, much smaller matrices and try and minimize the reconstruction error. So we want to, when we multiply those two matrices together, um, get the, the best uh, estimate of that original matrix. Um, and this is nice because it works really well in practice. Uh, there's really efficient and scalable algorithms for it. It's one of the best performing single models that, that uh, are typically in use. And prediction is really simple. We just simply take uh, for a user recommendation that user vector and we do a dot product between all the item vectors. And similarly for item similarity, we just take the item vector and we compute a similarity metric, cosine similarity or something like that. And it can handle this implicit data that we mentioned before by weighting. So there's a form of this model where those ratings um, are treated, uh, uh, the ratings are treated as weights of a binary kind of indicator matrix. And by applying the weighting scheme I mentioned earlier, you can just use the same model and you get pretty good results. So we've seen that scoring in recommendation engines is ranking. Given a user and a context, we rank the available items in order of the chance that a user will interact with them. And this looks really similar to a search engine. So given a query, we compute some similarity over our entire document set, and we sort the items based on that similarity score, and we return a ranked list. So this really begs the question, can we use a search engine to serve our recommendations? Because they look like they're doing pretty much the same thing. Well, at a high level, does uh, a search engine meet our requirements? Well. It's custom made and specifically designed to rank large sets of items, so we're good there. Uh, filtering is core to search engine, so that looks good. Uh, can we use all data at prediction time? Well, it depends. Scalability with that item set and feature set is baked into the search engine, and most of them have high, ava high availability elastic scaling these days. Can it handle cold start? Well, again, it depends. And can you easily incorporate new preference data? It depends. So what does it depend on? Well, uh, firstly, the, the serving uh, and the scalability depends on you using the inverted index. So the search engine, uh, you know, that's the, the, the real core of it and the, the, the way that it can uh, scale and handle uh, queries really fast. So we need to massage our problem to fit into that, that model. And for the it depends components, it really is model dependent. Uh, so whether you can use all the data at prediction time depends on what model you're using. The model itself and the computation itself needs to do that. And whether you can handle cold start and incorporate new data, again, depends on the model. But as long as the model supports it, there should be, in theory, a way to incorporate it into the search engine, in particular, the, the cold start fallbacks for content-based. OK, so this seems like a good idea. We've got a search engine that looks like it does the same thing as a recommender, and we should be able to use the same machinery. So how do we do that? Well, there are many more approaches, but I, I, I sort of see three main approaches. Score then search, native search, and custom ranking. And we'll go through each of them. So score then search is uh, the least integrated approach. And indeed, it's actually based on as it says, uh, scoring and then searching. So it's, it's two systems, um, and you would typically either use a scoring system to compute the raw recommendations first, and then use the search engine to filter to get the results, 
or you can flip it around and then f you know, first filter the results, or the candidate items at least, um, put, feed them into the scoring system and then compute your scores. So in most search engines, uh, you, once you've got from the scoring system at the top there, once you've got the IDs, you can pass those IDs as one, one of the filters into your search engine uh, and you get your results set. And likewise, uh, at the bottom, you know, uh, the search engine can spit out a set of IDs that, that satisfy your filters and then you can use that to, to only score the, the uh, relevant documents in your scoring system. So what are the trade-offs here? Um, the first advantage is that you have complete fl flexibility in the model that you can score. So having a dedicated scoring system means uh, you can potentially use uh, very rich contextual models, feature models, uh, maybe deep learning models for extracting that rich content. Um, and you can really focus on optimizing that scoring component uh, and get it as, as fast as possible. The downside, and one of the major ones in my view, is that you have to maintain at least then two systems. So in some cases, this may be unavoidable if you want to use a particular model, but uh, maintaining uh, you know, each additional system requires a lot of overhead, DevOps, um, and a lot of more things that can go wrong. But then you've also got this filtering challenge, um, and that, that says that, let's say you want you, you're scoring and then you're searching, that scoring system has to spit out um, a set of candidate IDs that you are then uh, post-filtered. And if you don't compute enough uh, candidates, then you might end up in a, in a case where you don't get enough recommendations because after applying your you know, metadata filtering categories and so on, uh, you, might, you might actually not, not have a result set. So it's, it's a difficult balance to strike. How many uh, raw recommendations do you compute in the scoring stage to pass into the filtering stage? So in some cases, it might, you know, it might make sense to filter first and then score, um, but, but you, might, uh, you might have similar challenges there. Um, and then adding that round trip between systems actually uh, means that your overall system performance can be a lot, uh, a lot slower than you think. So the scoring in, uh, piece can be really fast, but uh, adding, adding the, the search and the filtering and the round trips between them can kill that. So the second option is, okay, let's, let's move all the way to the other end of the spectrum and, and have a completely integrated system. So this is what I term native search. This is where we want to uh, effectively take that model and put it in a format that the search engine can just use without any modification. And typically, um, and pretty much in all cases, this requires pre-computation. So you want to pre-compute that model, crunch all the numbers, um, and you know, throw your, your massive uh, big data cluster at it, and then index those results in a way that makes search fast. So broadly speaking, uh, one of the, the main approaches to this is to use the uh, co-occurrence matrix approach. So you take that pre-computed uh, co-occurrence matrix that you did offline, and you'd index it, um, and effectively, what you need to index is for each item, you need to index the most similar items to that. Uh, so this means actually uh, for each item doing the full pre-computation of what are the most similar items. Now, if you're thinking that this is a lot of work, it is a lot of work. So doing a brute force uh, pre-computation approach of this nature uh, scales very, very badly, offline even. So it reaches a point where you need to do something smart. And that something smart is typically some form of thresholding. So you can either... Uh, threshold based on uh, a, a score as you go, um, but there's some smart ways to, to do that in a principled way uh, using the log likelihood ratio. Um, and this is a, I'll mention the links later, but this is done in, uh, in, in some of the literature and some of the uh, projects out there on GitHub. But the core idea is once you've indexed it in that form, then search just becomes a standard search query. So if you, re if you either represent, well, if you represent the user as uh, the items that they've previously interacted with, then you just issue those item IDs as, a, as the query string and you get back the results. So because you've done a lot of work up front and you've pre-computed everything and you've indexed it in the correct way, you can just drop it straight into your search engine um, and it does exactly what you, what you need. So the great thing there is that it's one system, uh, and you don't have to change the search engine at all. You do all the work offline. At query time, it's really, really fast. Uh, so, you know, 20 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. And because it fits exactly into the search mold, uh, it'll, it'll, ten, uh, it'll and you've thresholded, right? This is important. 
it, it scales really well. So even as the item set and the kind of feature set that you're using scales up, this, uh, this approach will still remain really fast. And depending on what model or what approach you use, you can use almost all your, your data. So uh, the particular model that I refer to you later uh, in the link is a, a cross co-occurrence model. So that uh, computes just uh, not just, let's say, on purchases, but on the cross co-occurrence between purchases and page views, uh, between con uh, content tags and page views, between any kind of item uh, metadata and user preference data that you can think of, you can correlate it back to what you care about, which is ultimately, let's say, a purchase or, or, you know, or a, a, a play or a stream. So that's great. Um, and at query time, you can, you can construct these multiple queries that take into account each of those, those components. But you really have to decide what to compute up front. So uh, you have to make that decision um, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a modeler. Um, and of course, the more, <coughs> the more you do, uh, the more data you put in, the more complex that computation is going to be. One of the key things here is that there's uh, no ordering retained in the index terms. So in the raw computation, using a, a threshold approach or log likelihood ratio, you, these, these ones are actually um, scores. And that score has a, you know, an interpretation that, that the higher it is, uh, the more kind of interesting that co-occurrence is. And, and you don't really retain that when you index it in this way. So it's very difficult to, um, to really keep that, that concept of ordering going. And then finally, there's, it's um, a lot more difficult to include the rich content data. So uh, textual data you can include by using a kind of bag of words uh, and similar approaches. But if you want to you know, use uh, images, audio, for example, it's difficult to extract that those features in a way that you can apply it in, uh, in this approach. So this is uh, implemented in the Universal Recommender and the Mahout uh, Correlated Cross-Occurrence Algorithm. Uh, so if you want to know more, those are the places to go. Okay, the, the third uh, side of the coin is one that I've done quite a bit of work on, um, and this is the custom ranking. So the key here is that we want to combine the scoring system and the search engine. Um, into one system, and we want to do scoring and filtering at the same time online, so in real time. So typically, we're not going to pre-compute here. So how does this work? Well, as we've seen before, the search engine and the recommender uh, look fairly similar. Um, you know, search ranking works more or less like this. We take a query, uh, we extract that query into a term vector that represents the search terms, um, and then we, our scoring phase is computing the similarity, typically some form of cosine similarity, um, between e that query vector and each one of our documents, um, and obviously the documents that, that fit a filter. Uh, and then we, you know, sorting is, is pretty trivial. We, we sort and we rank. So can we use the same machinery, exactly this machinery, um, for recommendations? Well, at the analysis phase, we're just given a user. And typically, that's a user or item vector. So that doesn't really work in the built-in mechanism. The term vectors uh, are not the same term vectors as we have in, um, in a typical search query. So they are kind of just raw double uh, arrays. Um, and they're not these kind of binary uh, term vectors. The scoring uh, is, again, not the same. But the core of it is that we want to compute some, sim some similarity or uh, custom metric against each of those documents. And then once you've got that, well, the ranking part is exactly the same. So how can we bend the search engine uh, to, fit our, you know, to fit our well? Um, and I should just point out I'm, I'm illustrating this with Elasticsearch because that's what I've worked with, but it's not limited to that. So the first is that we want to tackle this analyzer step. So we start with a raw vector, and we can use a custom analyzer to represent that in a way which is going to make our lives easier later. And this is a delimited payload filter. So this is uh, something that's not really that commonly used, but effectively uh, it allows you to attach a, a payload, and the payload is typically you know, a, a double or float number, to each term. So uh, here we actually use the um, this, you know, pipe delimited string, and the numbers to the left of the pipe represent the, uh, the vector indices. So those are going to be our terms. And the numbers to the right are, are our payloads, which are our vector values. So if you look at the, the way the term vector looks here, 
you can see that the term is, is zero, which is a, the first uh, you know, index in our vector. And the payload is, is a, you know, a binary version, but it's, it's this float payload that we care about. So once we've done that, we need to use this payload to do something useful. Um, and here we're going to use um, a custom function score query and, and a script. So we take the, uh, the vector, which is our query, let's say our user or our item vector, and we're going to pass it into our script. And more or less what we do is we extract those payloads for each term in the index and we iterate over each term in that index and we compute the score, which is just the, that payload with the, the vector value times um, the value of the query vector at that index. So this is exactly dot product. And if we normalize it, it becomes exactly cosine similarity. So now what we've got is a user item vector that we can analyze into a form that can uh, be fed into search term vectors. We have a custom scoring function that can score each of those query vectors against our document set, and then ranking is pretty much exactly the same. So we ticked all these boxes and we could actually use exactly the same machinery to score these um, matrix factorization factor models. And what's nice here is that we get the search for free. So the core scoring function is, is, is replaced. So instead of using the built-in search similarity, um, we use this, this you know, pure dot product or cosine similarity. But of course, we can mix and match that. There are different ways to, to blend the, the built-in scoring functions and the custom one. Um, we get the filtering for free. So all of these you know, tags, metadata, activity data, we can slice and dice exactly as we please. And we can issue any arbitrary search query as the, the meta query for this scoring function. So um, it'll work exactly as a, as a normal search query. It's just that all we're changing is, is the way that those documents are scored. So we get, you know, the, uh, we get the filtering, we get uh, free text search, we get uh, any of the geolocation um, uh, and date math type of queries, all of that for free in one system. So that's the key uh, benefit here is that we can combine these systems into one. And potentially we can incorporate these richer models um, because I've just shown a way to, uh, to represent a kind of simple matrix factorization model. But if we think more generally about uh, you know, embedding models where we can have uh, different vectors that represent the users and the items and the contextual data and the content data, uh, including you know, potentially uh, extracted features from you know, a deep learning model, for example, for you know, images and audio, we can potentially use that uh, same representation here to make, our, uh, to make the scoring work. So that has its limitations because uh, you know, the, the scale's sort of okay at the moment. Uh, so as you make those vectors longer and lo you know, bigger and bigger, uh, higher and higher dimension, and as you add more and more vectors, you're adding it significantly to the computation that occurs. Um, so it, it, it scales uh, up to a point, but you know, past a certain point, you're not gonna be able to incorporate all, the, all of those models. But really, this is uh, combining these two approaches, these two extremes, you know, the, the pure scoring uh, and separating that system with the pure, in, uh, the native search and integrating those systems completely. And you, it, it sort of sits in the middle. Um, so you get a bit of the best of both worlds, but of course you get drawbacks with that. Uh, so it does require a custom plugin for your search engine. You know, if you're running on a very managed environment, cloud environment, that might be a problem. So this is, uh, this is out there on GitHub as the Elasticsearch Vector Scoring plugin. Uh, there's, there's a version for Solar, which I'll mention later. Um, and also a, uh, a code pattern on, on IBM Code, uh, so IBM's open source developer site uh, that you can go and check out. Okay, so a little bit about performance and comparing some of these approaches. Uh, so this is the custom scoring performance. And as you can see, for, for, for small item sets, uh, this is a brute force computation, so scoring all, uh, all items with no filtering or anything like that. For small item sets, uh, it works pretty well and it's, and it's quite fast. But you can kind of see that um, in particular for large item sets and, and as we scale this vector size, um, it gets slower and slower. Likewise, you know, we, can, we can try and scale, especially at the, the high end, we can scale this computation by adding shards to our, our cluster. Um, so at low, uh, low numbers of items, adding shards doesn't really matter enough and, and actually uh, once you know, past a certain point, it, it hurts performance. Um, but for larger items, it makes sense. You know, adding, adding shards distributes that computation across more, you know, more nodes. 
um, or more uh, processes, and we get a speed up. But you know, the, the number of shards that you might apply to this to get that speed up might be a lot uh, larger than you would otherwise use for, your, for that particular index. So what about comparing to the score then search approach? Well, in this case, um, for a large item set, we, we can see that they're actually quite similar, um, and the score then search approach is a little bit worse. So the scoring piece of that um, is actually really tiny. So the pure scoring computation, which is just you know, a matrix vector uh, operation, is really, really fast. And you can make it a little bit faster, but it's not going to make that much difference. What really gets you is you know, the, the sorting and the searching. Um, and that's difficult to get away from. You, know, you can improve that a little bit um, with, with, you know, with filtering, um, and, but effectively you're incurring that, that round trip that I mentioned earlier. So one way to scale the scoring of this brute force approach is by using uh, locality-sensitive hashing. Um, and in this case, uh, what that is really doing is applying some kind of uh, pre-computation or thresholding, in a way, uh, to, that, to that item set. So if we're finding the most similar items uh, in a set, we are effectively using LSH to only search in certain buckets to find that item. Uh, so this is kind of this is fairly analogous to the pre-computation we did in the native search approach for co-occurrence. Uh, we do a, a, an exhaustive pre-computation, but instead of doing all the the work, we threshold it in some way. Um, and LSH is doing something similar. So not too surprisingly, you know, we, we can cut that down to around 50 milliseconds, which is in the range of the native search um, approach. So uh, by applying some pre-computation, we get to a similar performance. But we also Add, um, add some of the drawbacks from that approach. So uh, because we've pre-computed an LSH index, uh, we only search in certain buckets. We might be effectively missing some, some potential candidate items and some good recommendations. Uh, so we, we dramatically cut down the work that we need to do at, at runtime, but we, uh, we lose flexibility. OK, um, I'm, I'm going to very, very briefly mention a couple of pure search approaches that you can look at, uh, We don't, uh, just in the interest of time. So for content similarity, you can just use built-in more like this queries, um, which works pretty well if you don't have a lot of interaction data or as a fallback. Um, and then something that, that's quite interesting is to look at significant terms queries. So again, I won't, take, I won't spend too much time on this, and you can uh, come and speak to me afterwards if you're interested. Um, but you can effectively use a two-stage query by first getting the set of interactions for, let's say, a user. Um, so you can see the items that they've interacted with in the recent past. And then you have a second uh, query, which is a significant terms aggregation, which uses that item set as the background set. Um, and th the model that is built into that will, will naturally um, surface the interesting co-occurrences. So it's a slightly different um, you know, algorithm and algorithmic approach to a co-occurrence time problem, but you get very similar uh, r you know, results. And what's nice there is that there's no pre-computation involved. You do it all at runtime. Uh, so that may, you know, may be a bit slower than the other approaches, but it's definitely worth uh, looking at. OK, so just to uh, conclude, um, as I mentioned, for the custom ranking approaches, there's a solar version I actually came across today, this, this improved performance version of the, of the plugin that I wrote for Elasticsearch. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to see what the impact is there. I mean, they claim a... Um, you know, uh, up to a kind of 10 times performance improvement. So that makes those numbers that I showed before uh, significantly better. Um, and, you know, we'd, I, I'd like to dig deeper into the Lucene internals to see if we can get the benefits of doing kind of batched matrix vector math as well as the, uh, the custom scoring, or as part of the custom scoring to get speed ups. So in summary, we have this, uh, this sort of spectrum of Flex maximum model flexibility through to maximum search integration. Score then search sits on the one end of the spectrum. Native search sits on the other. Custom ranking is kind of in the middle. So they all have uh, different trade-offs and cost the benefits. Um, but these are the three approaches, and you know it's obviously up to you to to pick the one that uh, suits your model and your um, uh, your architecture. Okay, so thanks very much uh, for your time. Uh, I'd encourage you to go and check out codeair.org, uh, as well as the, you know, the IBM Code Patterns and, and IBM Cloud sign-up links if you want to know more. And I'll just say, I uh, just want to briefly mention that IBM issued a call for code 
uh, which is a global initiative to, um, to, to create open source disaster mitigation solutions. Um, and there's a $200,000 grand prize, uh, which, is, which is really interesting. So please go and check it out. And I have six t-shirts for that, which, um, which I'm happy to give away now. Uh, unfortunately, only medium size, but I've got six, so first come, first serve. Thanks very much. So we have five minute question. So, um, thank you, but um, what I didn't get is, you said that the, um, the third superior approach doesn't use any pre-computation, but uh, as I see it, you use some kind of metric factorization output for this. So, the vectors you feed into the index, they come from somewhere, right? Correct, yeah. Uh, but so isn't that the same, so computation-wise, the same amount like an item-to-item co-occurrence -item matrix? Um, it probably is similar overall. So, um, if you, uh, there is pre-computation involved. It's true. So you've got to train a model. Um, I mean, in all of them, are, in, even in the score then search approach, there's pre-computation uh, because you need a model first. Um, compared to the the very smart way of doing co-occurrence, so with some threshold or log likelihood ratio, probably the overall computation is is roughly similar. But generally, a matrix factorization via ALS uh, or or gradient descent on with, you know is fairly efficient, um, and you don't need to then exhaustively pre-compute all the recommendations. So that the, I, I should be more specific. The pre-computation is about pre-computing the recommendations, not necessarily the model. Okay, thank you. Other question? So thank you. Okay, thank you.